On the 17th of June, 2022, President Kasim Jomart Takayev of Kazakhstan, while sat on a stage right next to Russian President Vladimir Putin, completely scorched Russia's justification for its recent invasion of Ukraine, which was a total shock to Putin and to everyone watching. Because up until five minutes ago, everyone thought that Tokayev was a Putin lackey, like say President Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus, and certainly not someone who would humiliate Putin while sat just a few meters away from him. But that's exactly what it appears that he has done. I'm gonna give you a detailed account of this totally unexpected diplomatic incident and my best theory of why it happened. And then my friend, Michael Hilliard, host of the Red Line podcast and a leading expert on Central Asian politics is gonna tell us his theory of what Tokayev is actually up to, which I promise you will blow your mind. Let's do this. Hi everyone, I'm Fredo Rockwell, and it looks like Russia's decision to invade Ukraine, again, may have resulted in yet another geopolitical own goal for Vladimir Putin. This time, it appears to be undermining a key relationship with Russia's Central Asian neighbor, Kazakhstan. But before we get to President Tokayev's startling takedown of Russia's foreign aggression, let's set the stage, cause trust me, the context of Tokayev's actual remarks are just as shocking as what he actually said. Tokayev and Putin were both attending what is called the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, or, or SPIF. SPIF has been held in St. Petersburg, Russia, every June since 1997. The purpose of the event is to showcase Russian economic might and encourage world business leaders to invest in Russia. St. Petersburg, as you may know, is the hometown of Vladimir Putin, and he's been the official host of SPIF since 2005. So basically, it's Putin's event and he's in charge. In a normal year, Spief is attended by over 10,000 VIPs from over 100 countries from around the world. But this isn't a normal year. After Putin's decision to invade Ukraine again in February 2022, world leaders from reputable countries started making other plans. To make up for the fall in numbers, Russia has been encouraging pretty much anyone that still talks to them to show up. And even invited a delegation from Afghanistan's Taliban government to come. And Russia also invited the leaders of the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic, the two regions in occupied Ukraine which Russia recognizes as real countries, even though they definitely aren't. I've made a video recently about the two, quote, foreign ministers of these two renegade regions. Check it out if you'd like to know more. Putin and the leadership in Moscow obviously find these two people's republics really embarrassing but they simultaneously do actually want other countries to recognize them so that they seem more legitimate. Because if the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics aren't legitimate, then Russia's case for invading Ukraine, again, isn't legitimate either. So Russia decided to use SPIF to raise the profile of these two fake countries, and even arranged for the Donetsk leader, Denis Pushilin, to join the governor of the St. Petersburg region, Alexander Beglov, to mark the opening of the event by firing ceremonial cannon blasts. Because, you know, there's no more normal way of opening an economic forum than standing on a bridge and letting loose a couple rounds of artillery. On the third day of the event, the big man himself, Vladimir Putin, took the stage in what should have been the safest of safe spaces. He was flanked by Margarina Simonian, the editor-in-chief of the Russian propaganda channel RT, and the Spief guest of honor, President Tokayev of Kazakhstan, who, as I said before, up until this moment, everyone had assumed was just as much of a Putin flunky as Miss Simonian is. And then Tokayev dropped a verbal bombshell. After what sounded like some innocuous waffling about international law and the right to self-determination, he said this, if the right to self-determination is implemented worldwide, there will be over 600 nations instead of the 193 states that are currently UN members. Of course, that would be chaos. That's why we won't recognize Taiwan, Kosovo, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia. And then he said, apparently the same principle will be applied to what in our view are quasi-state territories, Luhansk and Donetsk. 
quasi-state territories. So right in front of Putin, he called the two republics, which Putin had recently recognized in absurdly over-the-top ceremonies, quasi-state territories. Ouch. And this really matters because Russia's only remaining objective in Ukraine is to protect the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics from what it calls Ukrainian aggression. If the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics are just illegitimate rebel regimes, which is actually what they are, then the entire rationale for Russia's current offensive collapses. And Russia is therefore engaged in an illegal, unjustifiable invasion. So let me drive this home one more time. Tokhev is basically saying that Putin's decision to invade Ukraine a second time was illegitimate, which is a huge slap in the face to deliver while on the stage with Putin himself. Ms. Simonian, the moderator, was so surprised by Tokhev's remarks that she didn't really know what to do. She just thanked him for being frank, which is what moderators say when somebody said something really shocking and they don't know what else to do. So let's talk about something else that makes this remark so shocking. As I said before, everyone thought that Tokayev was a loyal lapdog who would do whatever and say whatever Putin told him to. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Spief organizers would have assumed that's what Tokayev was or they wouldn't have invited him to sit on the stage with Putin in the first place. The reason everyone thought this is that Putin recently did Tokayev a huge favor when he saved him from being ousted from power during a violent revolution. Six months ago, a series of protests erupted across Kazakhstan, an event now known as Bloody January. These were sparked by a price hike in liquefied natural gas, the fuel most Kazakhs use to power their cars. And once the protests started, they spread so quickly and grew so intense that President Tokayev feared he was about to be overthrown. Tokayev then asked Putin to send in troops to restore order, which Putin did. Now, nominally, these troops were part of what is called the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is an international group of six states who promise to help each other restore law and order during times of unrest. But this is an organization which, in reality, is controlled by Russia. And so the decision to send in troops was Putin's, and Putin's alone. It worked, and within a few days, the protests were suppressed, and the danger to Takayev's regime was over. And so, while appearing on stage with a man who just saved his bacon a few months before, Tokayev gave Putin a verbal slap in the face, big time. And Tokayev didn't just refuse to recognize the two breakaway republics in Ukraine. His comment actually refers to two other breakaway republics Russia has propped up for decades, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, both of which are located in Georgia. Russia has used up a lot of time and energy trying to get other countries around the world to recognize South Ossetia and Abkhazia, something that I've made a video about. But Kazakhstan has never recognized either. And Tokayev thought this was a really good opportunity to remind Putin of this. And then, just to rub salt into the wound, he mentioned Kosovo, which is a part of Serbia which broke away in 2008. But since Serbia is an ally of Russia, Russia does not recognize Kosovo. So basically, he was totally exposing Russia's hypocrisy and inconsistency when it comes to issues of self-determination. Whatever you think of President Tokayev, you've got to admit that he had a lot of guts to say what he did, where he did, and when he did. So let's try and figure out why he did. Because as we'll see in a moment, you don't insult Putin live and in person and not suffer consequences. Even though Ukraine is nearly 3,000 kilometers away, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine again ruffled a lot of feathers in Kazakhstan. When many Kazakhs heard Putin recently claim that Ukraine isn't a real country, and that really Ukraine has always been part of Russia, they were reminded of some very similar remarks that Putin made about their country nine years ago. At a summer camp for patriotic youth in 2013, Putin said that Kazakhstan's first president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, quote, created a state on a territory where there had never been a state. The Kazakhs did not have statehood. This upset a lot of people in Kazakhstan. As did more recent remarks in December 2020 by two members of the Russian parliament, both from United Russia, Vladimir Putin's political party. Vyacheslav Nikonov, the chairman of the Committee on Education and Science said, Kazakhstan simply did not exist. And in fact, the territory of Kazakhstan is a great gift from Russia and the Soviet Union. When the Kazakh foreign ministry complained about these remarks, Another member of parliament from Putin's party, United Russia, 
Evgeny Fedorov, called on Kazakhstan to return the territory Russia lost when Kazakhstan was created during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Fedorov also insulted the Kazakhstan leadership, saying that they should pack up their, quote, little suitcases and just hand over Kazakhstan's territory to Russia. So after all that, Russia's claim that Ukraine is not a real country, and its decision to invade Ukraine again and declare chunks of it to be new countries played pretty badly amongst the people of Kazakhstan. In other words, when Kazakhs see what's happening in Ukraine, many of them think that their country might be next. And so if Kazakhstan was to recognize the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics, and therefore was to legitimize Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they would effectively be paving the way for Russia to someday invade Kazakhstan and take over part of their country. And so Tokayev is simply not going to do that. And actually, on the stage at Spief, just before President Tokayev made the statement that insulted Putin, Putin had said something that played right into Kazakh fears. Putin said he believed all territory which had been part of the former Soviet Union, which would include Kazakhstan, of course, was, quote, historic Russia. My guess is that when Putin said this, he may have only been thinking of Ukraine and other parts of former Soviet Europe. But Takayev, to his credit, wasn't having any of this. And he delivered what has to be called a diplomatic slapdown a few minutes later. I don't want to make Tokayev out as some sort of hero of resistance against Russian aggression, because I think Tokayev is just as prone to corruption and authoritarianism as any other leader in Central Asia. But still, I was glad to see someone stand up to Putin to his face. And no doubt, doing this will have helped Tokayev standing back in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan isn't a democracy, but when your people have recently tried to overthrow you, being seen to stand up for your country against a big bully won't hurt at all. There was, of course, immediate payback from Russia following the Spief incident. The very next day, the 18th of June, Russia closed the Black Sea terminal that two-thirds of Kazakhstan's exported oil uses on its way through Russia to Europe. The reason? The Russian authorities said that they needed to inspect for unexploded ordnance, bombs basically, left over from World War II. That's not quite as absurd as it might sound at first. Unexploded ordnance from World War II is actually a problem in several countries, and in the UK it shows up from time to time, and they have to shut down bridges and buildings and things. So it's plausible, but the timing is really suspicious. I mean, everyone understands that this was retaliation. The same day that the oil terminal was shut down, another member of parliament from Putin's party, Konstantin Zatulin, gave a radio interview on the station known as Moscow Speaking, which was full of anti-Kazakh rhetoric. After saying Tokayev's remarks, quote, looked like a challenge to the president next to him, Zatulin brought up the three million ethnic Russians who live in Kazakhstan. He then said that the Kazakh authorities, quote, know only too well that a number of regions, settlements with a predominantly Russian population had little to do with what was called Kazakhstan. He said, if we have friendship, cooperation, and partnership, then no territorial issues are raised. And if not, then everything is possible as in the case of Ukraine. As in the case of Ukraine, the country that Russia recently invaded in order to protect a Russian ethnic minority. Essentially, Zatulin was saying to Kazakhstan, shut up or get invaded. I don't think Russia realistically has the uh, capacity to launch a second invasion at the moment. They're pretty tied up in Ukraine, but something like this could happen in years to come. And the remark by Zatulin certainly was chilling. However, as in the case of Ukraine, Russia's increasingly aggressive attitude towards Kazakhstan appears to be backfiring. In March, a few days after Putin ordered his military to invade Ukraine, again, a rally was held in Almaty, Kazakhstan's largest city, to show support for Ukraine. Participants flew the flags of Ukraine and Kazakhstan side by side, and really importantly, the government officially allowed this demonstration to take place. A government-authorized demonstration of this sort in Kazakhstan, well, those are pretty rare, so it is a meaningful event. And in a recent episode of the Majlis podcast, Professor Azamat Junisbai, a Kazakh academic who teaches in America, said that there had been a recent spike in interest in the Kazakh language among Kazakhstan's Russian-speaking population. He said, I'm seeing more and more reports of people who you would never before imagine learning Kazakh, but they've joined Kazakh language clubs. They feel uncomfortable that they only speak Russian, and that is clearly in response to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. 
So rather than undermining Kazakh nationalism, the actions of Putin's regime actually seem to be strengthening it. Which I would say is ironic, except for pretty much every policy which Putin has pursued in the last six months has ended up with some sort of ironic unintended consequences. So eventually, I guess they have to stop being ironic and just expect it, I guess, don't they? Now, my friend, Michael Hilliard, host of two of my absolute favorite podcasts, The Red Line Podcast and Spotlight on Central Asia, has a very different theory about Takayev's remarks at Spief. And he possibly knows more about Central Asian politics than anyone else on the planet. So let's hear what he has to say. Okay, so uh, really excited to have Michael Hilliard uh, from the Red Line podcast and also the Spotlight on Central Asia podcast joining us. And Michael, you have an alternative theory of what President Tokayev was up to up on stage there with Putin. So uh, why don't you talk me through that? So Russia and, and Kazakhstan are in a really odd position at the moment. Now, right now, Kazakhstan, it does not want to get lumped in with Russia uh, at all. You know, it's very, very keen to show the rest of the world that we are not a Russian puppet state. Kazakhstan is not being punished that, for the war, and Russia worries that it will. Because Kazakhstan is probably the only Central Asian economy that is big enough to be able to order you know, airplane parts and machinery parts and mechanics and all these kind of things that the Russian economy needs with justifiable you know, deniability. And Putin is dealing with a Kazakhstan that only just scraped by a revolution in January. If Takayev was to be removed from power in a protest, then you would likely have a free-for-all oligarchs. And Putin is not completely sure who would take over after Takayev. So it's a... If I let this guy get up on stage and say a few words about me, uh, which sticks its stones, break my bones, you know, that means that I'll get to have a backdoor for sanctions that Kazakh, I don't have to go bail out Kazakhstan with 3,000 troops that I probably, he probably doesn't have spare at the moment. Uh, and he also has effectively, he can keep Takayev, who is the best option for him in Kazakhstan, in power. And this is a very popular move in Kazakhstan, apart from in the, in the very north. So it's a, it's kind of a, it's, not what Russia wants, but it's the best card Russia can play at the moment. Okay, so I have to say it does make sense, like what you're saying. But let me push back on one point. So for years, I've been hearing about what a, a genius uh, Putin is. And all of that has kind of come unstuck to me uh, with the war in Ukraine. Like everyone assumed that he was just bluffing uh, and that he was trying to sow division in NATO, and it's all backfires uh, spectacularly, or at least it seems to have. So maybe he's not smart enough to do what you're saying. So yeah, I think a lot of people have he's taken a bit of a hit in his reputation since February. But if they really are, if, if Takayev is really pushing back against Russia, he would do things like uh, not appear and not sign on to the Russian works at the Caspian summit two days ago. Uh, he wouldn't be, he'd pull out of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, he'd be pulling out of the CIS. They're still doing joint intelligence operations sharing between the two of them. You know, they're still on very close terms. The only thing they've actually pushed back on really harshly are some of these comments from very far out Russian members of parliament who are saying that Kazakhstan is part of Russia, which of course they're going to push back on that. It would be political suicide not to. Uh, so, so thank you so much for coming on uh, on my video. And for everyone who doesn't know who Michael Hilliard is, please check out the Red Line podcast and the Spotlight on Central Asia podcast. Do you, you have any other podcasts? Are those the only two? No, just just the two. I uh, I <laughs> think I'm supposed two. to have dinner with my wife at least once a once every week. You know, so I think John Keek stayed at the two podcasts for now. They're amazing. I use them regularly to make uh, for for sources for my videos. Um, and I know they're listened to by movers and shakers and important people all around the world. So if you want to have a better understanding of geopolitics, check those out. There'll be links in the description. But thank you so much for coming. Absolutely big fan of the show. So very happy to be on. <laughs> Thanks so much to Michael Hilliard for joining me. Honestly, if you have any interest at all in geopolitics, check out his podcast. They are amazing. And uh, yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys in the next video.